Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels and welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank everybody who's been leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And hey, if you would like to take a couple extra steps to help support the Historic Travels YouTube channel a little bit more, there's a merch store and a Patreon for this channel in the links below. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And all right guys, well hey, without any further ado, let's now get into today's topic. If I was to ask all of you, in the early to mid 1900s, what single explosion that was caused by man had the greatest loss of life? Well, if you would say this the dropping of the atomic bomb on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the United States toward the end of the Second World War, then you would be right. When these massive new type of weapons were dropped on these cities, the death toll and destruction of these atomic bombs was absolutely unimaginable. And it wasn't just the explosion of the atomic bomb that was a major cause of death. Those who survived the blast also had to deal with massive amounts of radiation and radioactive fallout that was left over from the use of these weapons. But what if I was to tell you that some 28 years before the dropping of the atomic bomb on Japan, there was another massive explosion in the city of Halifax located in Canada. And this explosion leading up to the dropping of the atomic bomb on Japan was the biggest man-made explosion in history, and it had the greatest loss of life in a single detonation. When this explosion occurred, Around one square mile of the city of Halifax was destroyed beyond recognition, and 1,500 people were killed instantly, and another 9,000 were seriously injured. So join me in this video as we now tell the story of the Halifax Explosion. The city of Halifax, located in the Nova Scotia province of Canada, is essentially a massive port city that sits right on the coastline of the Atlantic Ocean and is a major destination for all vessels doing the transatlantic route from the United States, Canada, or to Europe. Vessels stop at this port, whether it be massive freighters unloading cargo, whether it be passenger going vessels, you name it, ships stop at this port. And the same was true 100 years ago. Halifax Port was also another major destination for passenger vessels, freighters, you name it, these ships came through Halifax Harbor. But this was also the site of one of the worst tragedies to ever fall upon Canada in the early 1900s. Now, whenever a ship arrives in Halifax Harbor, they essentially travel through a very narrow channel and then the ships drop anchor in a giant bay within the harbor called Bedford Basin. But now this channel for that the ships have to travel through in order to get to this bay is extremely small. It's so small, in fact, that the officials within Halifax set up shipping lanes within the channel so ships would know which side to remain on so there was less risk of a collision. All incoming ships traveling into the harbor have to travel on the east side of the channel, and any outgoing ships leaving the harbor have to sail on the west side. If the ships maintained this rule and stayed on each side of their designated channel within the harbor, then there would be very low risk of a collision. The story of the Halifax explosion begins on December 6th, 1917, in the early hours of the morning, roughly 8 a.m. or so. Now, right around this time, the city of Halifax was beginning to wake up. You know, people were heading out to work, kids were going to school, the ships were actually getting active, you know, there were vessels coming into the port from their transatlantic routes, those vessels leaving the port of Halifax, heading out to begin a transatlantic crossing over to Europe. There was a lot of stuff going on. And another thing you have to remember is it's 1917. So World War One is currently raging over in Europe. Europe. And the city of Halifax and its port was a major area where goods from the Allies were shipped from Canada and the United States over to Europe to help out with the war effort. So there was a lot of activity in the city of Halifax during this time period. Now, right around this time, a French cargo ship called the Mont Blanc was preparing to enter Halifax Harbor and travel through this very narrow channel. Now, this ship was filled to the brim with explosives that were going to be used in the war effort. Now, under normal circumstances, this ship would be hoisting a red flag to warn other ships that this was a munition ship and that they would have to approach it with caution. However, it was not doing so because they did not want to risk any German spies that could be within the city of Halifax to know that this was a munition ship. The cargo of the Mont Blanc was the following. 2,300 tons of petric acid, 200 tons of TNT, 10 tons of gun cotton, and 35 tons of benzoyl. So when I say this ship was basically a massive bomb waiting to go off under the right circumstances, you know exactly what I mean. Now, right around the same time that the Mont Blanc was preparing to leave Halifax Harbor, another cargo ship called the Emos that is currently within Halifax Harbor was raising anchor and preparing to leave the bay. However, this is where things would start to go wrong on this particular morning on December 6th, 1917, within the city of Halifax. 
You see, as the Emos was preparing to leave Bedford Basin and travel through that very narrow channel in an attempt to reach the Atlantic and head out to sea, it encountered another ship that was also traveling through the channel and heading into Halifax Harbor, but this vessel was traveling in on the wrong side of the channel. So basically, it's on the wrong side of the shipping lane. And this forced the Emos to divert and get out of the way of this ship. But when the Emos did this, this ship was now traveling on the wrong side of the shipping lane as well. Now, in case you're wondering why the Emos didn't just immediately turn and get right back onto the correct side of the shipping lane after this other vessel had passed, there was another smaller ship that forced the Emos even further into the wrong shipping lane. So basically, there were two vessels in places they shouldn't be that forced the Emos into a position where it shouldn't have been. So as of right now, the Emos is traveling on the wrong side of the shipping lane. And further down the channel and, and coming into Halifax at this current time is the Mont Blanc, which is sailing on the correct side of the shipping lane. So as of this moment, these two vessels are heading for a direct impact. Now the crew on board the Mont Blanc did notice the Emos rapidly approaching, and they did try twice to signal the Emos and tell it to turn out of the way. However, the Emos failed to do so. Now at the very last second, the crew on board the Emos did reverse the engines and try to turn the ship. However, this in turn sent the bow of the Emos into the side of the Mont Blanc, and both vessels ended up colliding. Now the initial impact wasn't that severe. However, on board the Mont Blanc, several of the benzol containers that were on the deck of the ship sprung a leak from the impact, and then spun Sparks generated by the grinding metal of the two ships set the benzol tanks ablaze. The Mont Blanc is now on fire, and it's slowly drifting towards the shoreline. Now what makes this even worse is the shoreline that the, benz that the Mont Blanc is drifting towards is a heavily populated area where there are a ton of residential homes for several families that live in the city of Halifax. Now, the two vessels ended up colliding at roughly 8.45 a.m., and once the collision was over and the Mont Blanc began drifting towards the shoreline, the fire on board the ship began to spread rapidly. And it didn't take the crew on board the Mont Blanc very long to realize that there was no hope of containing it, and they knew the ship was at serious risk of exploding. So the crew on board the Mont Blanc evacuated. They lowered a lifeboat and got away from the ship as quickly as they could. Now, as they were evacuating the ship, they noticed that the vessel was drifting closer and closer to the shoreline. And during this time, the Mont Blanc began emitting some very small scale explosions. So a small little explosion here, a small little explosion here. And this was happening so frequently that the people that lived in the residential area of Halifax that the Mont Blanc was drifting towards began to take notice. And a lot of people began going to the windows of their houses and looking down at the ship. People actually began leaving their homes and walking down to the shoreline in order to watch what was going on not knowing how much danger they were in. Now the crew of the Mont Blanc that was in the lifeboat getting away from the ship was screaming at the top of their lungs, get away, get away, run. But you have to remember the Mont Blanc was a French vessel. So it's possible that some of these people were speaking French, which the people in Halifax don't understand. It's primarily an English speaking town. And it's also possible that the people there just couldn't hear them because there was so much going on and the Mont Blanc's drifting towards shore while the French people in the lifeboat are going away from the Mont Blanc, so it's possible they just couldn't hear them yelling. So all of this stuff that's going on is leading up to the ultimate disaster. And to make it even worse, there was another vessel docked very close to where the Mont Blanc drifted up to the shore, and they actually launched a lifeboat from this vessel to the Mont Blanc. And the crew on that lifeboat that actually went over to help the Mont Blanc ended up boarding the ship in an attempt to try to contain the fire. However, it was too late. It is now 9.05 a.m. The Mont Blanc has been on fire for roughly 20 minutes or so, and then finally, it happens. In an instant, the Mont Blanc erupts into a massive explosion, vaporizing 15 to 1,600 people instantly. All the buildings within one square mile of the Mont Blanc are ripped apart by the shockwave of the explosion. Any people or buildings that are out of range of the initial blast are still hit and pummeled by tons of flying debris, shards of broken glass. The entire city of Halifax is decimated in less than a second. The photo you see here is the actual cloud of smoke and debris that was generated by the Halifax explosion. Several of the survivors said that the cloud had a definite mushroom shape, very similar to that of an atomic bomb, although they wouldn't know that at the time since atomic bombs wouldn't be around for another several decades. But still, that should just show you the actual scale of the explosion. Now, just to give you a sense of scale here, when the Halifax explosion went off, People today believe the blast had the strength of around 2.9 kilotons of TNT. That is an absolutely insane number. 
And just to give you a little bit of further context, when they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima during the Second World War, that explosion had the force of around 15 kilotons of TNT. So for this not to be a bomb, for this just to be something, you know, man made a ship full of explosives, and for this to have been something that occurred 30 years before the atomic bomb fell, I mean, honestly, just the magnitude of this explosion is mind-blowing for 1917. Absolutely mind-blowing. And if you want to talk about sheer scale of destruction, even though the Halifax explosion was nowhere near as big as what happened to Hiroshima, the damage to the city of Halifax was shockingly similar to what happened to Hiroshima, minus the radiation and the fallout from the atomic bomb. Remember, the Halifax explosion didn't have this. This explosion wasn't nuclear. But still, I'm talking about the actual shockwave going through the city, the flying debris, the absolute decimation of the city of Halifax. If you really pay attention to it, there are some shocking similarities between what happened to Hiroshima and what happened to the city of Halifax when these explosions occurred. Over the next several days and weeks, as the recovery effort in the city of Halifax was continuing, it soon became apparent to everyone who was trying to help the city recover that there was a common injury reported among all the survivors of the explosion. And this injury was damage to people's eyes due to flying glass and debris. Why was this injury so common among all of the victims of the Halifax explosion? Well, to put it simply, it all has to do with where the people were at the time of the explosion. You see, because the Mont Blanc burned for around 20 minutes before the actual explosion occurred, there was a lot of people with their faces pressed up against the windows watching this whole scene play out with this ship on fire. And then when the explosion occurred, even if your home wasn't in the one mile zone of total decimation from the blast, the shockwave from this explosion still broke windows in people's homes for miles and miles around the explosion. And if your face was up against this window or looking in a window's general direction when the explosion occurred and the shockwave hit your building, well then you got a face full of glass. And this is essentially what happened. So many people got eye damage from getting glass blasted in their face. And some of these people's injuries weren't that severe by modern day standards, but at the time, they didn't have the resources to properly treat everyone. There were some people who had minor injuries to their eyes with glass and they could just take the glass out and help them. But due to limitations in medical technology at the time, there was several people who actually had to have their eyes taken out due to how much glass and debris was in them and essentially they had to go blind due to this explosion. There was such an increase in the population of Halifax that lost their vision due to this explosion that they actually built a new school for the blind people to help them adapt and adjust to themselves to this new way of life. I mean, when I say the city of Halifax was decimated by this explosion, it's almost too horrible to put into words what happened to these people on this day on December 6th, 1917. Anyway, guys, that's it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. And yep, now you know the story of one of the darkest days in Canada's history. You now know the story of the Halifax explosion. And before I conclude the video, I would just like to dedicate this video to the city of Halifax and everybody who lives there and to anybody who actually had a family member who was affected by this explosion. I have had the chance to talk to several people who lived in the city of Halifax, and, I ha and they have told me that they had relatives that were around when this horrible event occurred. And honestly, I can't even imagine what that must have been like. And you know, when you talk about something that occurred over a hundred years ago, it's easy to think about that event as ancient history, you know, just like the Titanic. But then when you actually talk to somebody who had a family member experience it firsthand, it really doesn't make it seem like it was all that long ago, you know? I mean, it's think, think of it like World War II. I mean, World War II seems like it was ancient history, but it really wasn't. There's a lot of people today that still feel the shock and horror of what happened during those horrible years. And I think the Halifax explosion or any major event from history is very similar to that, including the Titanic or any other major disaster. There's still people to this day that feel the impact from that horrible event. Special thanks to our first Captain Level Patreon supporter, John Shepard. Thank you so much for all the support, man.